Hello there, welcome to ITV News Meridian. Your headlines in the Thames Valley. Calls for stadiums like Oxford to ban greyhound racing. An animal charity says it causes suffering. Trainers and the venue say the dog's welfare is top priority. The play specialist from Oxfordshire helping to reduce fear and anxiety in young people in hospital is nominated for a national award. Emily feels like a gift and I think she really is a gift to so many patients. She's wonderful. Oh. <laughs> Also this Wednesday evening, keeping bikers safe. Calls for tax breaks on clothes and equipment that help save lives. And raising money for Rudy, the dad who's on a two-day cycling challenge to help his son walk unaided. Good evening. An animal charity is renewing its call for an end to greyhound racing in the next five years. The Blue Cross says it wants the sport stopped at stadiums, including Oxford, to avoid the dogs getting injured and even dying. Racing returned to the venue last year in front of record crowds. The Greyhound Board of Great Britain says it takes welfare issues seriously and overall greyhound deaths are the lowest ever. Penny Sylvester has our report. Greyhound racing has long been a sport of controversy. Supporters say the dogs are loved and cared for, both during their racing careers and in retirement. Opponents say the dogs suffer too many injuries on the track and many are abandoned when they're no longer fast enough to compete. Injuries do happen, but every greyhound can decide if it wants to run or not. We have dogs that come here to trial sessions, they don't fancy it, they turn around, they don't run. Not every greyhound wants to chase the overwhelming majority of them do. Greyhound racing is inherently dangerous. You know, over 22,000 dogs were injured um, during 2018 and 2022. So we really want to make sure that people sign our petition and look to end greyhound racing. Pre-race trials were taking place at Oxford Stadium today to introduce newcomers to the track and assess those who've returned from injury. Each dog is checked by a vet before and after running. We're always here, so as a vet at every track whenever a dog steps on the track there's a vet there on hand um, and so we're there to treat injuries and, and advise trainers and, and work with trainers. The fact that they're running 40 miles per hour around an oval track put huge amounts of pressure on their bones, their ligaments, um, there can be collisions so we would say that actually any of these injuries are, are very serious. You wouldn't put in the amount of hours that we put in um, it's, it's a whole life, it's a whole life. I've not had a holiday for years. You know, you are fully committed to your dogs. They're incredibly well handled from birth all the way through to, to retirement. The reason why we were looking at a, a phased five year end to greyhound races is so we can work with the industry. We can rehome all those greyhounds that actually need to go into a new home and have a good life. The sport's governing body, the Greyhound Board of Great Britain, says that welfare is absolutely paramount within licensed greyhound racing and the care and well-being of greyhounds is prioritised above all else. It says the Blue Cross is using misleading and outdated information, but the charity says it will continue to push for the sport to be phased out over the next five years. Penny Sylvester, ITV News, Oxford. A driver has been charged with murder more than a year after the death of a Reading teenager. 19-year-old Sheldon Lucock was riding an electric bike when he was involved in a collision with a van on Pierce's Hill in Tilehurst last August. He died from his injuries in hospital five days later. Ryan Willicum, who's 18 and from Newbury, is also charged with causing death by dangerous driving and attempted GBH. He's due to appear at Reading Crown Court tomorrow. A £20,000 reward has been offered for information about an attempted murder in Swindon, where a teenager was shot in the head. CCTV shows five suspects on the 24th of April travelling along Ramsbury Avenue on three electric bikes just after midnight. They then made their way towards the victim, where a sixth unknown suspect joined them. A 17-year-old suffered life-changing injuries when he was attacked on Oddstock Road. The victim was taken by air ambulance to John Radcliffe Hospital with extensive wounds. A man in his 60s is being treated in hospital after a substance was thrown over him in Oxford yesterday. An offender tried to barge their way through the front door of a property in Dashwood Road shortly after 8pm. 
He then threw a substance over a man. It's unclear what the substance was, but it caused similar results to pepper spray. The victim suffered minor burns. Officers say they don't believe there is any wider threat to the public. Reading West MP Sir Alok Sharma has announced he will not stand at the next general election. The former Conservative cabinet member who chaired the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow has represented the constituency since 2010. He's been critical of what many see as the government's recent climb down on its net zero targets. In a statement last night, he said that serving as an MP in the town where he grew up had been the honour of his life and deciding not to stand for the revised seat of Reading West and Berkshire at the next election had not been easy. A man's been jailed for assisting an offender in Didcot. 22-year-old Zaran Zaman from Milton Keynes helped two men who'd murdered 44-year-old Darren McCormick in Mendip Heights in January 2020. Zaman collected travel documents and clothing and funded their attempts to flee the country. Going to accident and emergency departments can be a daunting experience for anyone, but for children who are unwell and in pain, it's a very scary place to be, especially if they have additional needs. Well, with that in mind, play specialists have been introduced at the Children's Hospital at the John Radcliffe in Oxford. It's having a huge impact, not just for the children, but also the NHS teams who can work more efficiently. Well, one of them, Hemley Hodgkins, has now received a national award in recognition. With our story, Stacey Paul. Oh, Mummy's right behind you watching your painting. Emily feels like a gift and I think she really is a gift to so many patients. When I come on shift, if I see Emily in her red shirt down the end of the corridor, I know that my shift is going to be a better day. She is extraordinary. No matter who you speak to, patients, nurses or families, they all feel the same. Emily transforms the experience of being admitted to A&E. It can be very scary when we arrive in ED. You know, we've been through quite a traumatic experience at home. She's stopped breathing, we've had to resuscitate her. And having somebody there that already knows your name, that says, hello, how are you? Come here, let's get you into the room, can just give you that knowing smile of, you're going to be okay, everybody's here that you need now, and I'll make sure that everything's okay, it means so much to us. Through the power of play, distraction and care, Emily has transformed Edith's perception of hospital. She's been admitted on so many occasions over the past few years, but it's no longer traumatic. She knows that if she's got to have a blood test and blood taken or a cannula put in, she knows that she needs to request some bubbles, so she's quite bossy with them. Um, she adores their company. Oxford is one of only a handful of A&E departments to have a play specialist like Emily and she hopes this award will highlight the difference that they make. I'm really happy that play is being recognised and especially in accident and emergency departments. It makes a difference to the children, to their families and to other members in the team. We help the doctors and nurses to do their jobs more effectively and help the children to understand what's happening and things happen quicker. I'm hoping that all the A&Es across the country that don't have play specialists will, will look and see how important the role is. But it's clear that those around her already know how valuable the role is. She is fantastic with the infants, children, young people, adaptable to any of the patients that come in, whilst also making our day better as staff as well. It's traumatic being in hospital, and for children, their first experience of hospital can really affect the rest of their lives. We know it can affect mental health and well-being. And what Emily does is normalise the experience as soon as children and their parents and, and the rest of the family sometimes are admitted to, to A&E. She is warm, she is caring, she is thoughtful, she knows when she needs to be there for the parents and also when she's there for the children. She's there for a hug, she's there for cups of tea, she's there for every moment for your time in ED. She's wonderful. It's just a shame there isn't an Emily for everyone, but at least she's being recognised for the wonderful work that she's doing. Stacey Poole, ITV News in Oxford. Thoroughly deserved recognition as well. Uh, now, drone footage has been released showing Aylesbury's railway preparing for HS2. Network Rail says it shows work to realign almost two kilometres of track to Princess Risborough, which will allow the building of new high-speed lines beneath the existing railway network. 
A guitar string believed to have been used by Sir Paul McCartney during his time in the Beatles has sold for £1,600 at an auction in Newbury. The string was won by a fan in a competition in 1965. It was used by McCartney during the Rubber Soul recording sessions. Not bad. People will buy anything. <laughs> uh, now you're watching ITV News Meridian in the Thames Valley. Still to come on tonight's programme. Living her dream, we meet the racing driver from Hampshire, making her name in Formula One. And while Storm Agnes may be battering some parts of the UK, we're getting off fairly lightly down here in the south. I'll be back later with all the details. Uh, more, of course, from us online. All the details on the screen. And don't forget to follow us on social media. A man has been jailed for more than three years for a string of church burglaries across the Thames Valley. 61-year-old Christopher Coulthard from Warwickshire stole money from safes and donation tins. The court heard how CCTV, witness and forensic evidence had linked Coulthard to the burglaries carried out across Surrey, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire. Coulthard was also handed a lifetime criminal behaviour order which prevents him from entering any religious establishments within England and Wales. Now, road safety campaigners are putting pressure on the government to reduce taxes on potentially life-saving safety equipment. Air jackets can prevent motorbike riders being killed or seriously injured in a crash. And while bike helmets are sold without VAT, not all safety equipment is. And that's something that needs to change, according to some who say their jackets save their lives. With more, here's James Webster. Lee Vigor loves the freedom of riding his motorbike. He's been riding professionally since 2009, but a crash in 2018 left him with potentially life-threatening injuries. Unfortunately, I didn't walk away. I did snap my left leg off and I did break my right hip. But they can be fixed, they can be replaced. You, you, can, you can carry on living. But I do believe if I hadn't have had that air vest on that day, you can't replace organs and you can't replace a spine. Um, at worst, I wouldn't be a, a, you know, at best, I would be a paraplegic in a wheelchair, depending on my loved ones to look after me for the rest of my days. It was an item of clothing similar to this that Lee was wearing. It's not going to hurt you, it's just the most powerful bear hug you've ever had. And Peter Riley's offered me a demonstration of one of the jackets his company distributes. <laughs> oh! <laughs> The lanyard is usually connected to the bike. If the rider comes off, it triggers the inflation. And I can feel that in my back now. Holding That's holding it tight. Once it's activated, it's inflating in 0.09 seconds to full inflation, which is very fast, but it needs to be. When bikes are going 60 miles an hour, they're going 88 feet per second. So it's got to go quick, but they do go quick. But because they hold your spine straight, they eliminate violent neck roll, which is caused by the trauma of the crash. And they eliminate altogether hyperextension, which is very bad for you. Air jackets can cost in excess of £500, and the price can be a barrier for some. We've been chatting to bikers at Lumi's Cafe in West Meon near Petersfield. So an air jacket, I know they roughly start from about £600, but definitely recommended. You get some that are pretty clever and they... They expand while you're going through the air if you do go into a collision and stuff like that. Trousers are all protected, my jacket's all got armour in it. Gloves. You need it, really. I don't like seeing all these people going around in shorts. This is everything that I use on, on track. Uh, Joanna Benz is a regular here. She has thousands of followers who watch her videos on social media and has experienced serious injury in a crash herself. I had a a big high side uh, many years ago and I uh, suffered brain damage and it took a very, very long time, I mean years, to recover from. So I, I now make sure not to do anything that could contribute to another one. Although bikers make up just 1% of road users, statistics show they account for 20% of fatalities. That's why the road safety charity I Am Road Smart wants the government to make air jackets exempt from VAT to make them more affordable. If you look at helmets that motorcyclists are required to wear, because those conform to a specific safety standard, they will be uh, VAT exempt. And we would like to see the, th the same sort of thing applied to air vests and air jackets and uh, hopefully when we get to that point we will start to see 
more and more motorcyclists using them, and we think that that will save lives. But the government says it has no plans to extend VAT relief from helmet to air jacket and says it's promoting a road safety strategy that demonstrates how both drivers and bikers can prevent crashes from happening. James Webster, ITV News. That was really interesting. Um, it's 16 minutes past six and the ITV Evening News continues here with the national and international news at 6.30. Here's Lucrezia Millerini. A 15-year-old girl stabbed to death on her way to school. In Croydon, in South London, a bus driver and passerby tried to save her life. Police say a teenage boy believed to be known to the victim has been arrested. Also ahead, Bandit Britain. Retailers come together to tackle the sharp rise in shoplifting. We have an exclusive report. And Mike Tyndall and his fellow rugby stars show prisoners the power of sport. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Let's get some sport. Andrew joins us in the studio. And I'm loath to say it, Andrew, in present company, but the pain for Reading just goes on and on. When will it end? Oh, oh. Well, I wish I knew the answer to that. We I don't look at the table at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> we feel your pain, Sangeeta. Uh, yes, Reading have been placed under another transfer embargo after failing to pay an outstanding tax bill and they could be deducted more points. The fans are planning another protest during Saturday's home game against Burton. Similar to the one earlier this month, supporters will throw tennis balls onto the pitch in the 16th minute. The club have been deducted 16 points since owner Dai Jung took control of the club six years ago. The Royals could face the further punishment if he fails to pay wages on time at the end of this month. But could a takeover happen? Reports say three parties have registered their interest. Now, it's the EFL Cup tonight, with two of our sides looking to make it through to the last 16. Bournemouth beat Swansea in the second round, and the Cherries manager, who made it to three cup finals as a player in Spain, believes this is a fantastic chance for success for his team. My experience as a player, as a coach, I think... The cup competitions give you opportunities that probably for most of the teams you don't have in the league because uh, you are not uh, competing for the titles or for, you know, for the champions or whatever. So tonight, Bournemouth hosts Stoke, while Brighton travel to Chelsea and the draw for the fourth round takes place straight after this evening's fixtures. A racing driver from Hampshire has become the first woman to test a Formula One car in almost five years. Jessica Hawkins comes from Headley near Borden in East Hampshire. She's just completed her first F1 test for the Aston Martin team. The 28-year-old has been a podium finisher in the W Series and a British karting champion, but says stepping up to being a Formula One test driver is a dream come true. I cried before I even got in. Um, do you know what? It's just, I've spent so many years not racing um, due to lack of budget. It's been incredibly difficult to bring the budget in, but I will say that those short amount of laps, 20, 25 laps, how, how, however many laps it was, has made every single blood, sweat and tear worth that and so much more. Now. A dad from Portsmouth, who admits to having done very little cycling until now, has taken on a mammoth bike ride to raise money for vital physiotherapy for his son, Rudy. The four-year-old has cerebral palsy and needs ongoing support. Is Sarah gone? Found out. Zero accounting software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. Naval engineer Rhys Bingham says cycling has never really been his thing. He is, though, clearly willing to take on even the toughest of challenges for his son Rudy. He's just completed a 170 mile bike ride from his place of birth, Leicester, to his current hometown of Portsmouth, with the novice rider met on his return by a cheering Rudy. What's blown us away quite a lot is. It's not just a friend saying, oh, how can we help? We've had friends from pretty much all walks of our life who have 
So this is what we're going to do. Well, yeah, if the bikes would be great because he, he's got a trike, as you can see, and uh, he absolutely loves it. So I'm hoping in the next few years he'll outgrow his trike and be able to ride a bicycle himself. So I think it's quite good for him to see us all doing that for him. Four-year-old Rudy has cerebral palsy and this summer underwent surgery in Bristol to ease his pain and increase his movement. And to maximise the benefits of this, Rudy needs ongoing physiotherapy, much of which needs funding privately. It's an ongoing cost which requires an ongoing fundraising effort. It's so worth it. We're seeing such huge improvements. He's doing so well and yeah, like Reese has been amazing doing this work. And Reese being Reese, he will always do, as any parent would. You'd do anything for your child, even if it means doing a cycle when you haven't really done any cycling on a road bike for years. So yeah, exceptionally proud of what he's doing and the guys, yeah. We last filmed with Rudy a year ago when mum Fiona was preparing to take on the Great South Run. Back then the youngster was largely wheelchair bound, struggling to walk unaided and suffered pain which kept him awake at night. The difference a year on post-op is plain and so pleasing to see. He used to wake up in the night crying in pain and we couldn't get on top of it because he was on the maximum amount of medication that he was on. Now he's not on any medicine. It's just been phenomenal seeing the changes that, although they seem so little, they've made such a huge impact already. And whilst Reese might not be getting back on the saddle anytime soon, Rudy couldn't be happier with his ever-increasing mobility on his new trike. Sarah Gom, ITV News, Portsmouth. <laughs>and how much still remains. I think Brighton should be amazingly proud to have this lump of iron offshore. It's a fantastic ruin and the, the drone um, footage showed all of the wonderful detail of it from the foundations, from the cast iron piles which were screwed into the, into the seabed in the 1860s all the way through to much later delicate cast iron. It's 157 years since the West Pier opened to the public and became a magnet for tourists, attracting up to one million visitors a year at its peak. But the crowds dwindled and the pier closed in 1975. Decay set in as storms and arson attacks took their toll. So what does the future hold? It's remarkable it's still standing after all these years. Uh, no one knows, not even our structural engineers who are, you know, absolute experts on, on the structure. No one knows how long it will last. We're all surprised it's still so intact, but it can't go on forever. Far too dangerous for us to step foot on, the pier has become a haven for marine wildlife. Apart from birds, seabirds, cormorants, seagulls, of course, other and starlings, the, uh, the undersea world, which we weren't really able to see with the drone, is absolutely wonderful. And I think it ranges from frightening congreals all the way through to seahorses. So it's a wonderfully rich marine offshore reef. Marooned at sea, the West Pier remains an extraordinary landmark a tribute to the Victorian engineers who created this palace of iron. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News, Brighton. Looks stunning in those pictures. We were saying we don't remember it any other way. It's no, always been that's like that. That's it, that's how it is. <laughs> uh, let's get your weather now. Here's Pip. Oh. 
whatever the weather, it always feels like home. Valent Heat Pumps and Boilers sponsor ITV Meridian Weather. Hello there. Well, Storm Magnus may be on the scene for some parts of the UK, but actually here things are relatively quiet, if a little on the blustery side. And for the next few days, things look very promising. Plenty of sunny spells, some rain at times, but most of it falling overnight. However, it will still be a little breezy from time to time. So out there at the moment, still quite windy, some gusts of around 50 miles per hour along the south coast, a few outbreaks of rain moving eastwards as the night wears on. But later on it becomes dry, some clear spells developing, winds gradually easing down and you can see fairly mild for all. So tomorrow morning things looking pretty promising all round, a good deal of dry weather, plenty of brightness, some decent sunny spells, although the high cloud will make the sunshine a little hazy from time to time. And temperatures not quite as high as today, probably peaking at around 18, perhaps 19. Celsius, but winds of course will be a little bit lighter. These are the times of high water for tomorrow, then for Ventnor just before 11 in the morning and just after 11 in the evening. However, as we head overnight into Friday, we will see another area of low pressure moving its way eastwards, bringing cloudy skies, outbreaks of rain, but it will generally clear overnight. And for Friday itself, a little ridge of high pressure builds in, so drier, sunnier once again. And those conditions probably carrying us into Saturday as well. A good deal of fine weather to start the weekend, a little more cloud comes Sunday and perhaps some outbreaks of rain on the cards too. Valent Heat Pumps and Boilers sponsor ITV Meridian Weather. I said the same thing at the same time. Decent, not too bad. Not bad. Not I mean, bad. I'll take that. We'll it's, take it's, it. it's October on Sunday. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. It's right. uh, that is it from us. The ITV Evening News is next with Lucrezia Millery. I'll have your late update. That's just after 11 tonight. Please stay up for me. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>